year, prepared for this very kind invitation to participate in this conference as I did yesterday. I promised Yusuf that I wouldn't speak as long today as I spoke yesterday. And I had to explain to him that, well, you know, I'm from Ireland, and we speak, we talk a lot in Ireland. Uh, but I, I literally also asked me not to, to speak for so long. So today I will do my very best to synopsize uh, the views that I expressed <coughs> yesterday um, in what was a much longer paper. So um, first of all, I would like to just uh, pay tribute to the people of Kashmir on this very special day, the 16th of March, uh, because I understand that in 1846, that's when they became independent. And I know that you enjoyed, uh, the people of Kashmir uh, enjoyed independence for, I think, 101 years until two very profound and important events in 1947 changed that. And one of them, of course, was the uh, unlawful invasion by the, by the state of Pakistan. So now we have this situation where um, all of Kashmir is occupied and divided by two different states. And it's so interesting that um, Pakistan administered uh, Kashmir is frequently referred to as Azad Kashmir. And Azad means free. And of course, as we all know, uh, that part of Kashmir which is occupied by Pakistan is definitely not free. So I will not use that word again out of respect for the people who live in that region. So in relation to the issue of human rights abuses, um, I am aware of these human rights abuses as are all of you here, but it's not my opinion that matters or even the fact that you personally, many of you, are so aware of these human rights abuses. They have been documented by independent organizations such as, and very credible organizations such as Human Rights Watch, and indeed by two reports by the Office of the United Nations uh, Commissioner for Human Rights. And this is something that, um, you know, the international community must take cognizance of. It's not just my opinion or your opinion. But as the topic of the uh, discussion here today relates to the issue of human rights and freedom of expression, what is significant about those reports is that they have confirmed absolutely, and by reference to, to evidence um, uh, contained within those reports, that the people in Pakistan occupied Kashmir do not enjoy those basic rights of freedom of expression or association, and that all opinion, and that is very important to bear in mind. Just some of the issues that were highlighted in that report, uh, I will just mention them again. The fact that the anti-terrorism laws continue to be misused to target political opposition as well as civil society activists. Journalists continue to face harassment and threats in the course of carrying out their duties. The report also, especially from the uh, United Nations um, Commission uh, for Human Rights, confirms that there are credible reports that people have disappeared. And there are fears from the <coughs> groups that these people have been detained in military camps uh, within Pakistan. So it seems that there is no doubt whatsoever that the Pakistan government has control over the affairs of the people who live in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir. Reference has been made by Mr. Kashmiri to the uh, 1974 interim constitution. That has been described by a Supreme Court lawyer I mentioned yesterday. His name is Shamsad Hussein Khan, who has described this document as a sham and a complete biased document. Um, it's a constitution which bars anyone from public office and prohibits them from participating in politics unless they publicly support the principle of Kashmir acceding to Pakistan. And it is very clear that you cannot get a government job in Pakistan administered Kashmir unless you are prepared to accept the principle that Kashmir, Kashmir can only accede to Pakistan. This, of course, abrogates the rights of Kashmiris to the self-determination. And it also breaches their rights to freedom of expression and freedom of opinion. And uh, this is unacceptable. Um, 
on every level, but also principally because Pakistan is a signatory to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which gives these rights to people. So, as I said also yesterday, that awareness is one thing, and but finding a solution is another. And that is not so easy, and I don't proclaim to have all the answers to that, because I am very conscious that I'm sitting in a room full of very eminent um, historians and politicians and people from Kashmir who are so much more aware of the complexity of the situation than I ever could be. And I fully acknowledge and appreciate that. But in my own way, I just want to uh, make whatever observations I can in the hope that, that perhaps they might be helpful either today or at some point in the future to help the Kashmiri people get out of what I see is a very, very difficult situation for them. Uh, I made reference yesterday to the fact that we in Ireland had a, also a difficult situation, a conflict in Northern Ireland that resulted in many people, innocent people, uh, civilians getting killed. And as a consequence of, you know, support really from the international community, and I would say the United States of America was significant in that, as well as the British government and the Irish government. We signed, an agreement was signed on Good Friday in 1998, and it was signed on, on the 10th of April, which was Good Friday, and that's why it's known as the Good Friday Agreement. And essentially what this agreement stipulated and what it enforced and what it recognized and supported was the concept of consent or the principle of consent uh, in the exercise of the right to self-determination. And the reason why I mentioned that is because it can be used as an important precedent for the people of Kashmir because if this precedent has been established for the people of Northern Ireland, then also it can be established for the people of Kashmir. This precedent is now part of international law and diplomacy. And so it is in that context that I mentioned it, and uh, I think it's, it's important for that reason. So what I also suggested, and I would say it again today, is that I have heard and I've read in, in, in many journals that a lot of jurists and politicians, including politicians from other countries, will say, that all the situation in Kashmir is a bilateral issue between India and Pakistan. I do not agree with that. Human rights are never just a bilateral issue. They are an international issue, and that is really, really important. So a proposal I made yesterday, and one that I just wanted to affirm today, was that you might consider um, <coughs> the proposal to set up an international commission or to organize an international commission, compri commission comprising lawyers, jurists, experts in websites, experts in the International Court of Justice, uh, you know, ideally sponsored by the United Nations or under the auspices of the United Nations, to consider a number of issues with regard to the problems um, of Kashmir. Uh, and to deal with them or to have them analyzed in a legal sense. And there has been a lot of emphasis on the political aspects of the various UN resolutions, uh, but none so in, with regard to the legal aspects. And I think this could be very helpful if a report was prepared which would consider perhaps a seeking questions for the opinion of the International Court of Justice, which is the highest judicial organ of the United of the um, United Nations, and there are a number of questions that could be asked, and that could be determined by a committee. And anybody who wants to make representations to the committee, for example, on the legality and the lawfulness of the original treaty of accession by the Maharaja, and as Mr. Kashmir has pointed out. There were certainly some unusual circumstances, shall we put it, to the signing of that treaty. And these need to be investigated. And they haven't really been investigated to date. 
also the invasion by the Pakistani government. So there has never really been an international determination by an international judicial body on these actions. And that could be very interesting uh, as providing um, uh, you know, a step forward to try and get out of what is has become a very intractable and difficult and complex situation um, for the Kashmiris. I mentioned yesterday also that one of the original members of the, the commission that was set up uh, for uh, India and Pakistan, Joseph Corbett was his name, a Czech diplomat, also expressed concern that the Security Council at that time only dealt with the matter politically and not legally, and that's what weakened its position. And he took the view that that was the reason why the resolutions never really worked. And I would like to pay tribute also to Mr. Kashmir at this point for um, delineating the differences between the various um, resolutions, of which there were three in 1948 alone. And I do appreciate the point that with regard to the first one, uh, the option that was suggested was only for the people of Kashmir was either accession to the treaty, acceptance of the treaty of accession, or rejection which of course would have given the people of Kashmiri their independence if they had been given the opportunity in a plebiscite to vote on that. But because events overtook the situation, that never happened. And then you had a second resolution and you had a third resolution. And in the third resolution, there was only two options given. Only two, not a third which of course is very interesting. So as a consequence, it seems to me that there is still a little confusion legally about the effect of those resolutions. And because there never has been a plebiscite for the people of Kashmir, they've never had the opportunity to exercise what I feel is their birthright, and indeed their right under the Charter of the United Nations, which is to vote freely in a plebiscite, giving them the opportunity to have their, um, their freedom and to have their independence. And it is my earnest desire to see them have the opportunity to express that right. So this is why I suggested that it might be helpful to have some of those issues clarified legally because it could help to support a process which would enable a plebiscite to take place to allow the people of Kashmir to exercise uh, that vote. So um, that really was, was what I wanted to suggest uh, yesterday. Uh, as I said, I think it would give, and I, it, it would give clarity. So uh, all I would say to my friends here today is to think about that suggestion, to think about that proposal. If you consider that there is any merit in it, I will be very happy to work with you on it and to make myself available.